They include, as you were mentioning, deep sea vents, uh, hydrothermal vents, deep sulfur acid caves, things like this. These are ecosystems that are not exposed to any sunlight, and yet they continue to thrive. So it's an amazing adaptation of biology. But what we're looking at today is the basis of the majority of life on the planet, which is <laughs> photosynthesis. So what are plants made of? Carbon. Yeah, carbon's a big one. Carbon, in fact, makes up about 45% of the dry weight of plants. What else? Air molecule. What's an air molecule? Uh, yeah. Yeah, oxygen and hydrogen, definitely. Oxygen makes up about another 45% of the dry weight of plants. So in total, carbon and oxygen make up 90% of what a plant's mass is. Hydrogen makes up about another 6%, nitrogen another 1.5, trace elements, some after that. But the majority of a plant is made out of carbon and hydrogen. Where is that carbon, I'm sorry, carbon and oxygen? Where do those components come from? On the front of your handout, you'll see that I've drawn a leaf. Well, I didn't draw the leaf. I copied it from the internet. But someone has been generous enough to draw a leaf that I've redrawn up here. You know from your lecture that photosynthesis involves taking inorganic carbon from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, light, and water, and through a complex series of reactions, fusing them together to produce our products. Glucose, water, and oxygen. So if we just depict that schematically with arrows, we see light from the sun come in, the leaf intakes carbon dioxide, and water is brought up from the roots to the leaves. And this process is what together is known as photosynthesis. And it produces glucose, water, and molecular oxygen. So be sure to write down what I'm doing on the board. I gave you a template that you can add to. Uh, but it's important that you get these arrows because they're the crux of the issue here. So is carbon dioxide a reactant or a product? Reactant. Reactant, definitely. It's the raw material that we use, that the plant uses to produce, whoops, I misspoke glucose horribly to produce glucose. If you'll notice up here, I have certain colors that I've employed. Carbon dioxide is red. All of the molecules from carbon dioxide are red here. Water is blue. So if we look at the products, we can see schematically their origin. So we look at glucose. Glucose goes to make cellulose, which is what cell walls are made up of. And we see that the carbon and the oxygen are both derived from carbon dioxide. The water that's produced has a couple atoms of hydrogen from water and an atom of oxygen from carbon dioxide. And the oxygen produced is entirely from water. So again, we see that the dry mass of a plant, the 45% carbon and the 45% oxygen, are derived entirely from atmospheric carbon dioxide. What does that mean? That means that when I knock on this table, I'm quite literally knocking on solidified atmosphere, solidified carbon dioxide. In a very real way, plants are born of air. Kind of incredible. When you look at giant sequoias, giant redwoods, that go up 100 meters, 320 feet. You know, that 90% of that comes directly from the atmosphere. That's stunning to me. 
In this equation, I'm illustrating the same thing, except now each atom has its own color. Each atom from each uh, origin has its own color. So ah, before we do that, uh, at the bottom of this, you'll see that you have room to write down two equations. I want the equation to be this, but I want you to understand why. The first equation, we start with any chemical equation by looking at our reactants and we add them together. So we've decided that our reactants are anything that has an arrow pointing into this process of photosynthesis. So what are the three things? Just call them out. Yeah, carbon dioxide, boom. Light, boom. Water, boom. So you can write down six carbon dioxide plus 12 H2O plus light, which is exactly what you see flowing into this cycle. Then we draw the arrow, which indicates a chemical reaction has occurred. And we write our products. And you go back to your diagram to see what products have been made. And we see that a glucose molecule, C6H12O6, has been formed. We see that oxygen, six molecules of oxygen, and six molecules of water have been formed. So hopefully you see how we got that equation from this diagram. And double check it to make sure that's the same thing that I've written up here. Yes. <laughs> I also left room for you to write the uh, reduced or net equation for photosynthesis. This one takes into account where each of the molecules go, but since we have water on this side and water on this side, we can simplify it by subtracting 6 H2O from each side, with, which leaves us with 6 CO2 plus 6 H2O plus light goes to glucose, C6H12O6 plus 6O2. That's another way to write photosynthesis. Yeah. That's the one I got to Great. But, um, yeah, yeah, that's great. So um, understand that the reason I present you with this one is because it takes into account the origin and destination of every reactant molecule, whereas this one is just a really boiled down, um, in total oxygens do this, and in total hydrogens do this, but it doesn't take into account as cleanly the origin and destination of every molecule. So I want you to understand where each molecule comes from, or where each atom comes from and where it goes, but also the net equation, which I believe is what Linda has been talking about in class, right? Okay. So have you talked about reaction centers in class? Chlorophyll A, reaction centers. Okay. Um, that's okay. So really basically, chlorophyll A is a photosynthetic pigment. All right, we're almost there. Um, which means that it has this amazing ability to do this. It grabs energy from light. It harnesses a photon and uses that energy to drive this process to make energy for the plant, to produce wood, to produce paper and fiber and everything that the plant needs to survive. Um, each pigment has the ability to utilize different wavelengths of light better or worse. So when we mashed up that other plant and spread it out on a chromatography strip, we saw that there were different pigments in the plant. Only one of those is capable of pouring that energy into the rest of this process, and that's chlorophyll A. All the other pigments, their only role is to collect other wavelengths of light and funnel those electrons into chlorophyll A, which then funnels those into the rest of photosynthesis. 
So we have accessory pigments, which are everything except chlorophyll A, and their entire job is to funnel photons into chlorophyll A. These exist because, like I said, these pigments have different ability to use different wavelengths of light. So one of them might be really good at using blue. One of them might be really good at using red. Chlorophyll A is really good at two things and lacks another. And that's what we're looking at today is what's called the action spectrum of the pigments in LODIA. So we'll hopefully see if the experiment works that LODIA uses some wavelengths of light better than others. So in a plant like this, we know that the carbon dioxide comes from the atmosphere. Where does it come from in an aqueous plant? It's not exposed to air. So where is its source of carbon dioxide? Yeah, some. Anything in the atmosphere is going to dissolve in water, too. So if you just take distilled water, like I have here, and put LOD in it, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is going to dissolve in here and give the plant something to breathe. The deeper you go, the less that happens. Uh, but something shallow like this, it's easy to get a bunch of carbon dioxide in. However, I want a known concentration of carbon dioxide in here. So I used, everyone good with this? I'm going to erase it. Yep. So I used what solution? What's the solution I gave you? Sodium bicarbonate, which is written as NaHCO3 or like this. Now, I'm going to tell you right off the bat that there's a component of that that's carbon dioxide, and this is what the plants use. So the question is, when the plant takes away carbon dioxide, what's left of this molecule? What remains? So I'm going to box carbon dioxide like that. And you should do this on your sheet as well. And let's just look at what's left. We have a sodium plus, we have an O minus, and we have an H. <laughs> what's this molecule? Sodium hydroxide. Yeah, and what we know about sodium hydroxide? It's a strong base. Yeah. So bases do what to the pH of a solution? Raise or lower it? They raise it. Which means that in a solution containing this, if photosynthesis happens and takes away this, we're left with this which means that if photosynthesis occurs, the pH of the solution rises. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Great. 